Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we talk to Dave Marie Smith. Dave is based out of Australia. He's a former NAI basketball player at a school in Canada, and he is now a photographer who has done cover work for New York Times Magazine. Uh, in this episode, we talk about all types of things, such as him playing in Steve Nash in high school when uh, Dave was growing up in Vancouver, filming Rambo in his neighborhood growing up, uh, paparazzi, Tom Cruise, um, playing in the pit, Australian basketball, and much, much more. It's a little bit of a different conversation since it's not prep school basketball specific, but at least you're talking to a basketball guy who's got a different perspective and led a very interesting life. So without further ado, let's welcome Dave Murray Smith to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yes yeah, somebody wants me dave welcome to the podcast thanks for having me so for those that don't know us which no one would except you and i and uh <laughs> we met back in 2006 or 7 um, in Whistler, British Columbia. And my girlfriend at the time said, you got to meet my friend's uh, boyfriend. He likes basketball. And you probably felt this before too. And sometimes your significant other tries to, you know, hook you up with on a mandate. You're like, mm, he's probably going to be a tool. <laughs> so we canoed, you, we lived across the lake from each other. We canoed over to you to a dock. And immediately, I think within the first 10 seconds of us talking, you mentioned something about spud web dunking and, and showing your nephew like the 1985 dunk contest. And I was like, oh, well, this guy's six, eight. He's speaking my language. Let's go. And from that second on, we've been friends uh, all this time. So go figure. <laughs> That's right, man. I remember it very clearly. I had the same feelings where you're like, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. He likes basketball. It's like, how does he have a fantasy basketball team or something? But I, I remember very clearly meeting you and, um, hearing your story and being like, wow, this is cool. I like this guy. Yeah. And yours too, growing up in, in Vancouver, playing D2 and, um, you know, you and I are both, uh, tall white guys that didn't play much in college. <laughs> so we kind of, if it went, but it seemed like we got yelled at, had to do all the training everyone else did. But I think yeah. we both kind of bonded over that too, like not ever being the stars. Absolutely. There's this whole podcast waiting to happen just on on that whole series. <laughs> Into the bench. Yeah, that, that could be one. Yeah. Um, well, tell me this. You you grew up in, in British Columbia. Um, why yeah. basketball? What what why'd you gravitate towards that sport? Yeah, good questions. It wasn't, it definitely wasn't my first love. Um you know, I played like a lot of kids back then, especially I played a lot of sports. Um, my, my dad was an athlete particularly and kind of, so it was kind of always around the house, I guess, to a degree. And um, rugby was my first love, um, which was a sport that, you know, it's not a, a huge sport in Canada, but it is kind of has its own subcultures. And I, I played that and I loved that. Um, and then, you know, I remember, I think I was in about grade six. Um, my parents are originally from Oregon. And so I ended up going to a basketball camp in the summer because I think my parents took a trip down there to spend time with family. And so they put me in this basketball camp. Um, I'm struggling for the name, but it's, it's quite a popular one. And it was really, you know, it was kind of eye-opening and quite intense. And um, I just, you know, I really enjoyed it. And then I kind of started growing then too. And, um, you know, kind of started, I guess, just finding more and more time for basketball and, and started getting into it more. And then I had a couple of friends in school who started getting into it as well, which made a big difference. And cause yeah, it wasn't kind of the main, you know, hockey and, and other sports like that were definitely the main draw, but, um, yeah, I was just lucky that I found other people who wanted to play and, and, kind of went from there and you were playing in british columbia about the same time steve nash was right right i remember we we um we played against them in high school so steve nash transferred high schools for his senior year and so he had to sit out um 
I don't know the exact details, but we played them um, in an exhibition game. And so it was kind of this scrubby group of dudes. And we, I didn't know who he was at the time. And so we rolled out and uh, it's probably one of my, actually, you know, if I look back now on life, it's like one of those moments where everything came together is I actually got a dunk off the opening tip mm. um, and then proceeded to probably not score for the rest of the game because Steve Nash and they had another guy on their team whose name escapes me, but he played at University of Colorado as well. They had a good squad and they just dismantled us and it was so it was kind of after that, that was, that was really, it was all downhill from there, but, but yeah, there was, um, Steve Nash was, um, a year younger than me, but so I did play against him. Could you tell he was good just in that exhibition? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, he, our point guard didn't get the ball over half court, you know, wow. like literally he, his handles and, you know, I mean, I, one of the things I remember clearly about him when he was younger because we he got recruited really heavily by the university that I played at, and so he came and scrimmaged with us a lot, and 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 trained with us and stuff. And his in you know intensity and his competitiveness were something that you know at that point no one foresaw right. obviously what was happening because you know there was talk of him maybe trying to go to the U.S. to play at a Division One school, but even that you know a lot of people were just like at that point Canadians now it's you know there's a lot of Canadians playing division one and it's very common and um but at that point it was still there was more tragic stories than success stories of Canadians going south you know a lot of guys who would go play for a year and then kind of get spat out the other side and come home and so people were always really weary of of whether guys could do that and that was you know seemed to be the case with him but he was so competitive that I just don't, you know, I mean, I remember that very clearly. He was just like a, like a rabid dog, you know, just after it. And what university did you go to? Simon Fraser, right? Yeah. So I went, I walked on to um, Simon Fraser University, which is in Burnaby, which is kind of a part of Vancouver. Um, and um, that was, Let's see, I graduated high school in 1991. So that, yeah, September of 91 was when I was on campus for the first time. I was only 17 when I started in university. And what was like, like your first practice with those guys? Oh, uh, you know, it was, I, I went up in the summer. I got, um, you know, I, I met the coach in the summertime and I went up and I watched some practices of some scrimmages and whatnot. And, um, you know, I kind of had a bit of an idea of where they were at. And thankfully I grew a lot that summer. So, cause I was, you know, I was a boy when I finished school. Um, and I, I grew quite a bit and I got up there and I remember being really, you know, definitely intimidated um, because I wasn't one of those guys who just wanted whatever you put in front of me, you know, at that point, I hadn't kind of really gotten comfortable with all those sides of myself yet. And so I was pretty intimidated, <coughs> excuse me. There was at that point, especially <coughs> Simon Fraser had a really good team. You know, they were definitely the best team in Canada. Um, uh, you know, a lot of guys who, because at that point, Simon Fraser was NAIA, um, which was, you know, um, a different league to the NC2A, but, American. So it was the only Canadian school playing American teams. So we were playing like Central Washington, Western Washington. Um, There's a team in Alaska at that point, um, Lewis and Clark. So because of that, and it was actually it was the only school that could give scholarships in Canada at that point. No other universities were giving scholarships. So it managed to pull a lot of the good players from across the whole country for those reasons. Because you could compete against Americans and you could get a scholarship. So it was definitely, you know, a level that I'd never competed at before when I got there and um, very intimidating. But, you know, I was also really lucky in that they at the time had a coach, Jay Triano, who oh, yeah. is, 
Yeah, he's a great coach. You know, he was a head coach of the Raptors for a while, head coach of the Suns. He's now an assistant with Charlotte. Um, you know, Canadian basketball um, legend and a great, great coach. You know, really a guy who just knew how to develop people and could see potential. And he always wanted a couple guys around who maybe weren't, like physically their abilities they probably shouldn't be there but just their attitude and their kind of desire got them access and i was i think i was one of those guys for him where physically and ability wise you know i didn't really deserve maybe to be there at that point but he knew that i was willing to work hard right um and so that i guess you know allowed me to be there but yeah i was definitely you know kind of intimidated a lot of big guys, you know, 23 year old men, you know, who were big and strong and, and, um, it was, yeah, it was a, a big change. Yeah. And what, uh, what was the biggest thing you learned from your playing time at Simon Frazier? From my whole time there? On the court, more, more basketball wise versus. Oh, the that, wise. Well, I mean, you know, the intensity like that, is required to kind of be in that environment was probably something that, you know, um, I remember, you know, kind of realizing like, wow, this is like, this is all, you know, all time, this is all the time, you know, this is um, to kind of jump to that level from high school where, you know, I played at a small school and we weren't great. <clears throat> um, to, to being in that environment of kind of, you know, having coaches around you and, and a team that demanded like a level of performance. It was just being in that environment of, 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 you know, whenever you stepped in the gym, it was go time. Like it was always just intense, 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 compete, compete, compete. Um, and I remember that, you know, it was just, it's kind of relentless, right? Um, you really have to be up for it. To, yeah. To in that environment and to to want that and to you know push through and get there when you're tired and you got exams and you got all these other things and then you walk in and you have to kind of switch on and that's nai level which kids don't understand how competitive nai is they think it's d1's the king and then d2 then d3 and yeah. any level of college basketball is going to be a step up with that grind and that's you know yeah. what i'm trying to tell kids all the time is like it's not just d1 like Anytime you bump up a level, it's going to be harder. And we have a coach coming on, Coach Kelly Wells, that used to coach at Pikeville in Kentucky. And that's where Toby Earhart, my first prep school kid ever from, golly, Surrey, up in British Columbia, he ended up signing with them. And Kelly ended up winning an NAI national title a few years later and um, as a coach. And it's a knife fight. That NAI team there could beat about a third if not yeah. half of all the D1 teams out there. So it's just constantly letting kids know, like these are kind of the differences between the levels and whatnot. So it's always good hearing, even from your end of like, you know, West time zone in AI yeah. school, even back in the day, it was very competitive on a daily, daily basis. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's almost in some ways when you have, you know, there were a lot of guys on our team who, you know, were and were were division one caliber players not a lot but a few for sure at that time you know we had one guy andrew steinfeld who was a, a two-time nal nai first team all-american um played on the national team um you know had had injuries that probably prevented him from maybe doing more than what he did but he you know played professionally in europe for a long time we had a lot of guys who played pro in Europe and played summer league NBA and different things like that over the years. Um, uh, maybe not a lot, but some. And so you have guys who just, you know, they're, you know, even across the board, their skill level might not be that D1 athleticism that, you know, coaches love and hone in on but their desire and their competitiveness was there. So it's like, it doesn't really, the, the ability is one thing, yeah. but that's a relative thing to everyone on the court. It's the intensity and that 
kind of ferocity that people bring, I mean, that can, you know, it, it's, it's almost, it, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you're at D1 or D2 at that point, because that's the same for some people and they might just not have the size or the ability or the other things to make that leap, but God, they want it just as bad. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's very competitive environment. Um, and that was, you know, we're going back now. That was, you know, geez, almost 30 years ago. <laughs> it was 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you old man. <laughs> the math's going. Um, yeah. So, you know, even, I mean, I, I will get to this later, but I watched practice here um recently a few weeks ago for a, a job and um and it was the basketball institute here the nba academy and i mean i was just so impressed with mm -hmm. their level the intensity they were practicing at it was you know mind-blowing you know, we're gonna get to we're gonna get to australia we're gonna get in that delorean time machine and go back a little bit all right <laughs> now correct me if i'm wrong a story I remember you telling me is when you grew up in Vancouver as a kid, mm -hmm. you remember when they filmed Rambo First Blood in your neighborhood. That's right. <laughs> Tell me what that was like, because that's an iconic movie, and that was just happening on the street. <laughs> yeah, so there were, it, they filmed it in different places around BC. The main, do you remember the town in that film? Hope. Yeah, so that's Hope, which is about an hour and a bit away. Um, That's where I got but, my first win as a, co a coach ever was in the Hope <laughs> Tournament. And fa fast forward, just so you all know, when I was in Whistler and met Dave, I was the head coach of the secondary school there, which is the high school team. Didn't know what I was doing. Dave and I talked a lot about this, probably had eight guys on our team. And we went to the Hope Tournament. And I was like, guys, the reason we picked this tournament is because this is where Rambo took place. And we drove across <laughs> the Rambo Bridge and my kids had no clue who he was. I was like, and, and we won our, my first, I think I won two games as a head coach ever at the varsity level. And one of those was in Hope. So that place has a near and dear place to my heart. Like, but that was like one location. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's like but, awesome. the two most important things in your life, Rambo and, and, and Hoops. Canadian high school basketball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they filmed some of that in your neighborhood. So, yes, Hope was the main yeah, town. Yeah. Brian Dennehy, Sylvester Stallone. But what did they do in your neck of the woods? So there's, they're next to, um, where I grew up, there's a big canyon, um, very, you know, wilderness area. And a lot of the, you know, I think that you remember the one where he, did he jump off a cliff and he bounced all down to the trees into the bottom of that canyon. It was all hurt and hanging in there. Lots of the scene, the wilderness scenes were all filmed in there. And I actually remember, um, I don't know if this is urban folklore or not. I'll have to try and research this for you, get a fact checker on it, but, um, apparently they had like a um, armory right with all the weapons and stuff and someone broke in and stole all of them <laughs> <laughs> and which at the time i thought was just the coolest i was like can you imagine like you know kids running around with like 8k47s and stuff but um yeah i don't actually know if that's true or if that was just a bunch of kids talking at school but like for the neighborhood like did you did you see sly walking around no, unfortunately not. I, we knew it was happening, but um, it was, yeah, we didn't get to see him, sadly. So, this is going to, there's, there's no purpose to this podcast, people. So if you want to turn off now, you can. We're going to be doing a lot of rambling. But when I was deployed to the Middle East in 2003, I was there in the summer and we had a couple of celebrities come through, right? Lee Greenwood came to our base and sang, Proud to be an American. Okay. People love that. I, I boycott that song. That's another diatribe. Uh, Secondly, Blink-182 was flying around, and my buddy tried to fly them. He didn't. But we got an email one day that said, hey, Brian Dennehy is coming to our base. Does anyone have anything they want to show Brian Dennehy? And everyone in our shop looked around like, I don't know. Does Brian want to see our computers, you know, or where we sleep? Like, we had nothing. But then again, like, people were fighting, fighting to, to fly Blink-182 around the Middle East. And when Brian Dennehy's email came through, we're just like, I don't know the sheriff, you know, the sheriff from Rambo. Like, what do you do with that? Like, I hey, Mr. Dennehy, here's our outdoor toilets. They're a little bit more permanent than the Army's base. Like, <laughs> that's my Brian Dennehy story. <laughs> I thought you'd be into it. <laughs> I I don't know. When you have, you know, Blink 182 is hot then. Like, that's that's the guy you wanted to like. And Alyssa Milano came through 
and there's pictures of this online. She gave autographs to the soldiers without a bra on. And that would have, yeah, that would have bought her some currency for sure. That bought her some currency. It went yeah. viral. That was an army base, not ours, but like that was, that was the other big thing was, uh, was her making an appearance out there. So, so you didn't see Brian Dennehy walking around in a sheriff's outfit. I mean, you know, I could have, but at the time I didn't clock it because the film hadn't come out yet. Right. So <clears throat> I probably didn't even know who he was. So now yeah. when you, when you saw that, did you like in that Canyon, were you like, Hey, we used to play cops and robbers in that uh, same area. I mean, yeah, look, I remember, I don't know the specific spot because it's a big Canyon, but I think I know where it was. And it's actually kind of on a walking path that to this day, when I'm back, um, I still go and take my kids on and stuff. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it was right in that zone where it was filmed. So, but at that point, Vancouver was like, everything was getting filmed in Vancouver. Back Did you then. see anything else when you were living around there? Like, were you an extra or? I, I, my mom and I were extras in a, in a Ralph uh, uh, Macchio uh, <laughs> movie. Macchio, is that what it is? The Karate Kid? Yeah, we were extras in one of his films that was terrible. Um, my mom actually did a lot of extras work. She was, <clears throat> remember Jody Foster's film, The Accused? Yeah. She's in the court scene um, and you see her like, because I guess they had to keep the people consistent that were right. in the court you know because um so she's it in that movie a whole bunch so it was hollywood north because the dollar was so weak but it looked like america so everything was getting filmed up there have you seen children of the corn <clears throat> not in a very long time i remember being terrified yeah no one's seen that since the 80s but there's a scene in the beginning when like the couple the main characters are driving through this town it's deserted and these two little kids are running around like spying on them one of those little girls is now my sister-in-law. <laughs> <Get out. laughs> yep. And she's That's in the so scene weird. when they're like going, kill, kill, kill. <laughs> uh, she's in that scene and then like pan over her. And I was like, That's you. That is hilarious. That's kind of a creepy film to be in when you're a kid, huh? Well, she they they came to her small town in Iowa to film it and just like I, I guess the whole town was extras. So that's yeah. the prep athletics dog maple barking. So perfect. Yeah, part of the part of the thing. So, uh, okay, so that's pretty neat uh, that your mom was in the accused. We uh, when we were in high school, blue blue chips came out. Remember blue oh, chips? Yeah. So Mike Patino was Rick Patino's son, and Rick Patino was one of the opposing coaches to Nick Nolte in that. And Mike Patino was like right behind his dad in some of these scenes, and we all went and saw it as a team. And where normal kids would get like, "Hey, you're in a movie," all we did was harass him and make fun of him, and it was actually detrimental that he was in the movie the way we treated him <laughs> versus with reverence <laughs> so, like, so. I love kids man that's hilarious oh uh, buddy all right um when you played college ball did anyone go to your games you know it, it was not really i mean you know we'd get a few hundred people sometimes if it was a big game um but the funny part was that it was just like all extremes for us because we cheer would you know back back then again i'm sure it's changed but division one schools could um have exhibition games at the beginning of the season mm -hmm. and um so they'd line up like soft games to kind of like ease into their into their uh, calendar and the teams that would play them would get paid. And so our program, that was kind of like one of the ways that we, you know, funded it was we'd go play D1 teams and, um, you know, they'd fly us down, they'd pay for all the costs, they'd, and they'd cut a check for the school. And so we would go, you know, kind of in the early season. I remember, you know, one year we went, we played University of New Mexico in the pit. Wow. <laughs> almost 18,000 fans. Um, we played uh, University of Texas, El Paso, um, New Mexico State, uh, Montana, Montana State, Idaho, Idaho State. Like it was a good, always a good run at the beginning of the year. And so, yeah, like we played in front of like 18,000 people. They had a blimp flying around inside the dome, like a mini blimp. And then we'd go back to our gym and it was like, tumbleweeds blowing through you know right. so we 
have these incredible kind of tastes of like what the big show is like and then go back and it was like you know my mom like somebody's girlfriend right. <laughs> maybe the field hockey team just got back from a road trip so they'd hang out in the gym and watch <laughs> it was definitely quiet yeah that, that happens i mean not every college programs like new mexico or kentucky or, or teams like this um, back to whistler I'm, I'm gonna bring this back because there's interesting stories here right so in that oh, town yeah. of whistler where we met um it's where they had the 2008 olympics one of the biggest yeah. if not the biggest ski mountain in north america <laughs> where seal and heidi klum lived at the time so a lot was going on there um the guy that was the manager of the golf course i can't remember his name but he was on the canadian national team yeah, Alan Chris Manson. Yes. Okay. So I went and met with him because as the coach, I was trying to meet anyone in the community that knew anything about basketball. And I think you probably gave me that lead. And I walk into his golf shop and up on the wall framed is a picture of him shooting over Carl Malone and David Robinson. And I said, what is that? He goes, oh yeah, I was on the Canadian national team and we were the first team to exhibition against the, the dream team from 92. You know, the famous American team with Jordan, Bird, Barkley, all those guys. And I think they played it in Portland at the Rose Garden. And I think Canada either won that game or they were winning up until the last minute. And he, he told some great stories on that. So I brought him in to talk to the kids, right? And then there's Greg McDonald, right? Greg McDonald. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he grew up playing with Steve Nash um, on AAU teams and whatnot. And then we had you there who played college. I think there were a couple of bouncers at the club who played Juco ball or something. So I gathered all these minds, which were like in single digits in Whistler to our gym to play against my eight guys who, you know, tried hard, but we had like nine practices before the season and they just didn't know the concept of basketball. And we had like five on five. So the, the guys that knew basketball versus my kids and every play we'd have to stop it. And you guys would talk to each player like, hey, you shouldn't stand there. You got to put your hands up here. You got to cut there. And it was really nice because there was like 15 people in the gym that scrimmage that kind of all bought in together. And even though you know, those guys played college ball uh, on a team, and we'd only won two games and whatnot, it was just kind of nice to have kind of a lot of powerhouse talent in that yeah. gym that you would never know if you just went to the golf course or saw Greg in his job. So it was kind of neat. I yeah, I mean, I remember because um, I I played against Al a lot in college because he went to SFU and he would come back and train in the summers um, with us. And he was actually he was the go to guy on that Olympic team. I went wow. down. To, I remember because Jay, who was our head coach at SFU, he was coaching on the Olympic team that year. Uh, he was the assistant. And um so we went down and watched that game in Portland. Oh, you were there. Yeah. What was yeah. that like? I mean, it was cool. It was cool. I remember, you know, we, cause in the lead up to the game, you know, we got there kind of the day before and went out to the hotel bar and, you know, Christian Leitner was there and there was a bunch of, um, you know, famous NBA kind of personalities and stuff. Uh, I can't remember. Um, uh, the names of some of them now, but like just a lot of old school NBA guys and, um, and it was just very exciting, you know, to see kind of Canada competing against those guys. Yeah. So remember, was it a, was it a close game? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember Al's story. Uh, you know, I I remember Canada putting in a really good fight, and then it very quickly turning and and being very uncompetitive. But I think they competed up to a certain point, and then um, we uh, I remember from that too because Jay was coaching, we went down to the floor and said quick hello to him. And um, uh, David Robinson was standing nearby. And I remember seeing him kind of, you know, from maybe like 10 feet away, but on the floor, same level. And I remember just thinking that's like the biggest human I've ever seen. His guns were so massive. You know, it was like one of those moments of seeing someone like that and just being like that's a whole different level of person right there like i've never seen anyone so big in my whole life as the admiral but do you want to hear my admiral story absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so 
Admiral was my favorite player growing up and I originally signed to play at Navy and he sent me an autograph picture and it was awesome. And then Navy actually, and my mom requested, it's not like he was sending that to all the, and she probably paid for it. Let's not get ourselves here. She probably got on whatever it was before eBay. <laughs> so ended up not going to Navy. We fell through with that thing. I ended up at Air Force and then fast forward to probably 2013 or 14. I was at Navy because one of my players from Kentucky Signed at the prep school. He was taking a visit. And I heard that David Robinson was there to get like his jersey retired or something that weekend. So I'm sitting at this table with the family from Kentucky, the head coach of Navy. And this guy walks up. It looks just like David Robinson. I'm like, oh, it's him, you know? So he's like really happy talking to me. He looks like David, but a little bit different. And I stand up and I'm taller than he is. And I was like, I, wait, a minute. wait a second. It's David Robinson is shrunk and he's really looking at me and like, you know, touching my shoulder and being friendly to everybody and then takes off. I was like, did David Robinson, was he sick? Like, did, did something happen to him? And the head coach is like, no, you asshole. That's his brother, Chuck, or whatever his name was. I was like, Chuck Robinson. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it turns out his brother's like a preacher from Virginia Beach or something that looks just like him, but not 7-1. And I'm sitting there the whole time like, Dave looks different. How so am I cool. supposed to know he's got a brother walking around campus the same day, right? Chef Robinson signing autographs on his behalf. Charging I was about months. to ask for one. He's gonna be, <laughs> hey, David. Uh, not David. No one would have to know. Uh, so, anyway, um, that was... Back to, I want to go back to what you were saying. Sorry, I kind of derailed us there with my Robinson story, but about that, your coaching when you were in Whistler. Oh, yeah. And just being in there. And I, I do really remember, I mean, I have to say, like, you know, it was not a basketball town, obviously, you know. Um, and um, I, I recall very clearly kind of the seriousness that you brought to kind of coaching there. And that was, I believe, your first kind of coaching experience. And um I do remember being like, wow, this guy's really serious about this. Like, you know, despite the fact that you were coaching a bunch of kids who had no idea. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a lot, you know, it wasn't like what you're used to now with, you know, parental support and things like that. It was, you know, it just wasn't serious, but uh, you really did a good job with those kids. You taught them a lot. And there was one kid too, a big kid who was quite into it, right? I forget David Kovac. Remember David, his, his voicemail? Leave a message for David Kovac. <laughs> yeah, he was our team captain. He went to a couple camps with me in the States. And uh, his parents ran a coffee shop. So you could always get a free hot chocolate. That was yeah, one of the perks. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do recall it was, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, definitely a new thing in town. Because um, there were, you know, like people who had hooped for sure. But it was like, uh, you know, aside from a kind of a, a fledgling men's league that would pop up every now and then really it was like people weren't there to, to hoop or to you know it was kind of a something in the past so it was fun to kind of have it come up when you were there definitely yeah but let's not kid ourselves it was an afterthought for those kids as well because if it was a powder day i they were like hey can we just get practice day to go powder you know get yeah. some runs in i said guys we have like nine practices like and we have to teach the entire game of basketball and these nine practices <laughs> with no, eight kids powder. Well, sometimes with eight kids, like six would show up. You can't do five on five. You can't work on a press. You can't scrimmage. And I remember our first game might have been against your old high school. Does that sound right? Collingwood, isn't that where you went? I went to Collingwood. Was it against Collingwood? Maybe. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. that wasn't, no, that wasn't the first game. The first game was at some <laughs> tournament. And it was, it was, it was, we played like the host team at like, 2 30 which means the entire school came to the gym to watch their host team and the host team as you know always plays the worst team first yeah. next thing i know right it's my first game as a high school coach i'm in a suit everyone else in sweatpants i'm trying to overcome my insufficiencies by dressing nice next thing i know we're down 19 to nothing just the gym is going nuts and i've was called like four timeouts what's that was it pemberton no that's our rivals this was down uh east of vancouver Okay. Couldn't tell you the team. And oh my gosh, like when we scored two points, it, it was like a victory. And that was such a weird year. And so I've coached, you know, at the, that level of Canadian basketball, then Kentucky, right, where they're 
they're diehards. And then like a top 10 Nike elite school in DC at Gonzaga. So I've seen every single level and they've all got their own charm and whatnot, but yeah. Canadian ball, when you have no idea what you're doing is a perfect place to hide and kind of get some lumps out. Um, Sharpen your knives. Oh, right? <laughs> geez, just the, the, the hijinks we had That's to go funny. through there, but you know, and you, you know, you're a famous New York Times photographer now, but you were our official team photographer then. So I <laughs> don't know how many teams in America or the world have an eventual New York Times photographer as their team photographer. So think about that. That's funny. Yeah, I remember we sent a we sent a, an article. I think you proofread it. We sent an article to the the Peak News the Peak. Magazine, yeah. hard news source, with a trying to get a little bit of a little bit of PR for the team. <laughs> The peak was great because you try to get it early to find apartment rentals for the for the week, right? So if you're looking for an apartment, you'd be waiting at Friday at like 10 a.m. Like, I got to get the peak. Yeah. What's oh. available? <laughs> and which one of these job op offerings will pay an American illegally under the table in cash? That's the other thing I was looking for. Not apparently. You should. <laughs> oh, you, no, I got paid in, in uh, grocery. What was it? Grocery gift cards by a certain unnamed entity. It's a public company. Oh. But... <laughs> That was, I was like, I can't do this. I'll just, I'll dip into my savings to live in this beautiful place. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, that was a good time, man. So tell me this, we talked basketball and stuff, but like you're now a photographer. When, when did that all start in your life? Um, about the time that we were getting to know each other, probably just not long before we met, um, my now wife, uh, at the time girlfriend and I, um, we took off and we went on a big trip around the world backpacking. We went to you know, Thailand, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, um, <clears throat> Australia, traveled around. And, and before we left, um, my dad bought me um, a camera. And um, I remember he said, he was like, well, as a gift, I'm going to get you a camera. That'd be awesome and at the time digital cameras were just starting to kind of pop up and um i remember he bought me a minolta um fully manual um, camera with a 50 mil lens and at first i was a bit like because oh, i didn't know how to mm. use it at the time you know and um and film you know shooting film and but so we went on this trip and and i just really you know I really got into it and um i didn't develop the film until the end of the trip so it was kind of a really different experience where i wasn't seeing the pictures i was taking i was just you know would get up and go for walks early in the morning or and it just became a really interesting way to meet people and talk to people and and um yeah i really got into it and then we you know ended up back and developed the film and i you know love that process of then seeing all these pictures and kind of being able to re-experience things and um but then it kind of you know got back into my rhythm of living in whistler at the time i was working in a job uh you know in community outreach working with youth and and kind of youth at risk and whatnot and and you know i kind of put the camera back down and um but I, you know, kind of still had this kind of desire to get into it. And so I ended up taking a couple of courses um, in Vancouver to kind of just, you know, just for fun, really, in photography and, and getting more into it and starting reigniting that kind of passion. And then, you know, I just hit a point where I realized, like, I don't want to do what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I want to do something different. And um luckily had some support from some people around me who kind of encouraged me and said, you know, just give it a crack, give it a try. And so slowly started just doing little things here and there, you know, shooting the Worcester basketball team for the peak newspaper. <clears throat> maybe that could have been one of my first big jobs right there. I don't even, maybe. I might've paid you a hamburger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if anything. <laughs> I doubt you probably still owe me the burger. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding you to that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it became, you know, uh, a little more serious part of my life. It's something that I was doing in my own time a lot. And then the big jump was my 
again, now wife and I decided to move to Australia and try, you know, at the time it wasn't a permanent thing. It was just like, let's go and change our lives and, you know, just live differently. Um, and in doing so, I decided, well, when I get there, I'm going to reinvent myself. I don't want to be a photographer. And so when I arrived here, I just said, all right, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And had and just kind of figured it out. So it was a very steep learning curve, but um, yeah, that was, that was the story. It came from just a just genuine interest and, and kind of desire in it. So it sounded like you really took a leap that a lot of people probably wouldn't have the, the nerve to do. I mean, move to a different continent with no, with just kind of a dream and hoping it worked out. I mean, that's, that's a big risk, Dave. It, it was, you know, and, and I, I don't honestly know. I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe in some ways uh, I'm a little more risk of, you know, I, I'm more comfortable with that kind of stuff maybe than others, maybe not all, but it was, when I look at it now, I definitely kind of go, geez, you know, because it was literally, it, I wasn't 20, you know, at the time I was in my thirties. Um, I had a fiance, she's from Australia, but she hadn't lived here in 12 years. Um, we moved to Sydney, which is, she's not from Sydney. So we didn't know anybody. Yeah. We had no cash at the time. Um, and we just said, well, let's just try something different. So it was, it was, and it was difficult, you know, it was a very difficult time in a lot of ways, but that's kind of life, right? Like, you know, you kind of, you, you know, um, you certainly don't have to, but when you put yourself in new environments and stuff, you grow in different ways. Um, and that's definitely been the case for us. And it's been interesting because of that experience when you move somewhere new and kind of start fresh, you're able to track backwards, like w see where you are now and go, okay, I know how I got here because I met this person mm. and I met that person and I did that. And that happens when you go somewhere and start like totally fresh because everything's, it's like grant, you know, patient zero. And then, um, so that's been really cool to be able to see it. And it's been something that, you know, career-wise has been really interesting because I can actually, when I talk to people about, oh, how do you do this? It's like, I can kind of say, well, this is exactly how this happened for me, um, which is cool. All right. Someone comes to you and says, we're going to, we have a spot in the Louvre in Paris for one of your pictures. Which picture do you pick to put up on the wall there? <sighs> That's a great question. Um, That's a tough one. I apologize for that, but... Yeah, I mean, I I have there, there's a handful of pictures that I really really enjoy, and mo to be honest, most of the pictures that I really enjoy are maybe ones that other people would want to look at. I'm like I that happens to me all the time, where like, so, oh, you want to put a picture in a print sale or something? We're doing, so, yeah, and I'll pick one, and have, like no one will buy it because it's one that I'm like I should have let my wife pick or mm -hmm. you pick or something else because I. I, you know, big part of um, why I love photography is I love people. I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories. I love those experiences. So I'm not like a, the kind of photographer that's just out like hunting for pictures. A lot of the time for me, it's about trying to tell a story and trying to kind of connect a viewer with an understanding of something. And so, um, some of the pictures that I really love might seem kind of unremarkable to other people, but they, it, you know, allow me to kind of access that memory or that place or that time or that feeling. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, I probably would pick one of my kids, which is kind of not a lot of people would want to look at, but those are the ones that I really enjoy for sure. You ever done paparazzi work? I haven't. I mean, I've like, um, I did, a, I did, I photographed some guys um, who were, it was like a press junket thing, they call it once, um, several years ago, they were two Australian movie stars and, um, you know, I had to go to their hotel and deal with their manager and all that. And I, I realized real quick, I'm like, I don't want anything to do with this type of 
you know, that side of the industry because it, it's just, um, I didn't enjoy it even slightly. <laughs> that was Hugh Jackman and Nicole Kidman. Is that who you're talking about? <laughs> um, right. um, no, these guys, I don't think anyone would even know who these guys were. What, Silver chair? You know, Vikings, you know Vikings, the, the show Vikings? I know I couldn't tell you a single person in it. Apparently one of them is in Vikings. Now. Okay. Um, they're, um, yeah, that, you know, photography is like, uh, maybe like cooking or, you know, um, there's so many different kind of avenues within it, um, that you can really be such a specialist in such different ways within photography. So, but as you're, you know, even starting out, it's really interesting because it's like, which way you go is really there's a very different outcome. You know, you can get into wedding photography, you can get into press photography, you can get into commercial photography, nature photography, wildlife, you know, and they're all very different, but, you know, so you kind of are making this, if you're doing it for a career, you're making decisions about like, how do I want to spend my time? You know, like, what do I want to do? Yeah, I'm taking pictures, but only certain, you know, I'm pretty picky. Some photographers just love having a camera in their hand and they shoot kind of both almost anything and everything and they they love that part of it whereas for me it's there's like kind of an investment um in the story of what i'm doing that is the part i really like yeah help me with this with the and i was joking about the paparazzi thing but i'd be curious like if i gave you a challenge like all right 30 days yeah you're going to la and you've got to get as many celebrity shots as possible that's almost like an amazing race for you like to see like and i give you like a Every A list celebrity, I'll give you two thousand dollars. And every G list, you get fifteen hundred. And if you get Andy oh. Dick, it's like two fifty. Like, I would give you this challenge. I think that'd be great TV because you'd be reluctant, not really wanting to do it, but you'd have to oh, hustle. Totally. Trying to talk to people, I'd, I'd be, I'd come last for sure. Maybe a Dave, David Robinson's like shorter brother. brother. Yeah, Chuck, <laughs> Chuck Robinson. <laughs> I know you can find him. I got his business card. So yeah, that guy wants to talk to everybody. He'd be easy. I'd be getting selfies with him. Um, That'd be a fun but, challenge, though, is because you'd be uncomfortable. Uh, you'd be a fish out of water. Like, how do I do this? But like, could you do it? You know, you are a photographer. You're very well qualified. But like, then you got to get into like more of the special ops version of it, of like hiding out and being patient. Uh, and, I mean, I I have good friends who you know um, do that kind of stuff for sure. Really. And, yeah i have two a couple of friends in particular who are you know um and they shoot a lot of things but they're what you call press photographers so one day they're shooting a guy coming out of the court one day they're shooting you know uh, a politician the next day they're shooting this like they're always assigned on something different one of my friends dean sewell who's a legendary photographer amazing uh, craftsman and his, he's got a great story about his first ever assignment um he was like you know he started in the dark room at the sydney morning herald when he was 16 and just developing film and doing that and then as they call it a cadet and then he got moved up and he got paired with this old crusty photo journalist who was going to kind of teach him the ropes and on his first day they were doing a court thing and it was they had to try and get a shot of this uh police officer who was corrupt and who finally got busted and the 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 older guy was like okay i'm gonna post up here he's probably gonna come out this way so i'm gonna be here but i want you to go down and hang out by that side door because every now and then they pop out the side door so just go down there and be ready he goes down there sure enough the guy pops out the side door <coughs> and um my buddy Dean, you know, to his credit, just starts shooting. And the guy winds up and it fully physically attacks him. <laughs> and this is his first day. But I heard the story because I was at Dean's house and he's sorting through a bunch of stuff and he pulls out this picture and he's like, oh, this is the first picture I ever took, like as a news photographer. And it's this like heavily flashed guy wielding up ready to throw a punch at him i was like what's the story here and it was like that was his first job like this guy this guy tried to knock his head off <laughs> that but is he got great 
That reminds me of a story. One of my friends uh, from Lexington on his uh, mantle has a picture of him and Sandra Bullock, and she's not smiling. And I was like, what is going on here? And he, at the time, uh, was a real estate broker in uh, or agent in New York City, and they had some office listings, and Sandra Bullock needed a new um, office space for a production company. So him and another young guy had a car, and they were going to show her around. Well, they showed her a few offices. It was not what she wanted. And it just, something went sour, right? Which my buddy, if you knew him, it'd be not surprising. And it turns out she ended up calling Donald Trump while she's in the car with him to go see um, one of his office spots in Trump Tower, right? This this is back in probably 2000, early 2000s before Trump was um, (laughs) uh, that big. But uh, yeah, and my buddy also was supposed to be the next day, I think, uh, Sandy Bullock and Hugh Grant were doing like a scene at Yankee Stadium and he was going to be in the seat behind them as an extra that was one of the perks but something went sour right I don't remember the story but after she's done with him and the buddy and she's going to go to Trump he's like hey uh, sorry it didn't work out can I get a picture And she's like no that's that's unprofessional I'd rather not he goes can I still get a picture and she's like, Ugh. and so you see in that picture, her just disgusted with him. And he, he loves it. I love it too. I was like, that's a I great was going to say that you would love that. The same guy, the same guy, Dave has another picture right next to that. Paul Bettany. Do you know who Paul Bettany is? He is a uh, vision. He's the red guy vision in the Marvel comic universe. Okay. 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 He's the red guy that floats. I don't know anything else. And my buddy lived on Roosevelt Island in new york and paul bettany's wife is jennifer conley remember jennifer conley okay and they have like their son or kids with them and they're filming a movie but my buddy lives on rosetta valley he's like well i live here i can do what i want to so he gets ready to raise his camera and paul bettany goes don't take a picture of my kid and he takes it and then paul bettany comes over yelling and he puts the camera up and gets it again so there's a picture of him and an angry sandra bullock and then him with paul bettany coming at him like this and my buddy's like this is my island i live here f off and uh i mean those are the kind of pictures i went dotting my my house because there are such great stories with them right i love it anything awkward right (laughs) i mean it's terrible at the time but in hindsight like sometimes something terrible happens you just know in your head like this sucks now but gonna be a great story later (laughs) exactly worth it that's my life story right there oh totally i'm sure sandra loves that story i mean it must happen all the time right i mean uh. well um i actually uh that same guy dean sewell that i was telling you right he um he has a great story about tom cruise and nicole kidman where they they arrived into australia this is like you know I can't remember when they were together, like late nineties, early two thousands, whatever. <clears throat> and they had apparently negotiated like all the heads of the newspapers and stuff were like, they're going to arrive. Don't mess with them. Let them come in. We're not going to try and photograph them. Then because Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, especially in Australia had a lot of star power, right? They could sway, you know, people to do what they wanted. My buddy is a freelancer and he was like, I don't care. So he he followed him out of the airport and um, followed him in his car and they clocked him and um, Tom Cruise pulled over on the highway, got out of the car. And so my buddy's got pictures of Tom Cruise storming out of their car up the highway with Nicole Kidman in the background kind of unleashing on him. And they're, you're not supposed to be here. This wasn't supposed to happen. And you know, my buddy's just starting away. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, yeah, I mean, it would be, you would, that would, you would love these pictures. These are right up your alley. You know, Tom Cruise throwing a hissy fit on the side of the highway, charging at him. Hey, so. instead of this wall of concert posters behind me, I want to get, I want to get uncomfortable. I mean, <laughs> mind you, we have to respect the famous people, right? They don't, you know, we don't want to be in that position of having our privacy and whatnot. So I'm going to give that disclaimer, but they're pretty good stories and you're getting paid millions of dollars to maybe have your privacy a little bit invaded. So yeah, kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Hey, what's the, what's the best part about living in Australia and what's the worst part about living in Australia? Um, the best part would be, um, you know, the lifestyle for sure. Um, it's beautiful. It's, it's, uh, 
very healthy, very safe, very, you know, nat natural, the natural environment's incredible, the ocean, um, really unique place, you know, crazy animals, platypus, koalas, like it's, it's definitely, it's a kind of a, a really, for someone from North America, you know, it's a really kind of cool place and um, very, yeah, very healthy, good health care, good, just, you know, um, really uh, a good, healthy place to live. Um, the most challenging part is just being so far away from everything, you know, um, for me, especially, I'm still really connected to home, to my family and, and whatnot. So it's, it's a, a, a big haul to, to kind of get back and see people and kind of, um, you know, enjoy. I love the mountains still. I love skiing. I love those things. So that's the, by far the worst part is just being um, literally on the other side of the planet from, from a lot of the things that I, I really care about still. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've made it work. We, we still are able to travel back and forth quite a bit and, and spend time there and um, whatnot. So, yeah, so far it's working out. And now that you've been down there, you've done a lot of work with the New York Times. Are you on, how does it work with the New York Times? Are you just, they call you up when they need a certain thing shot? Are there a bunch of New York Times photographers in Australia? Walk me through that because, Dave, that's one of the biggest publications in the world and that's very very esteemed and that says a lot for you to be able to do work for them and get cover work for them and like the new york times magazine so like walk me through and other people that don't know how that works like how they came about and what that means sure i mean they're you know um they're a publication who one has obviously a huge following two has um like still have pretty healthy budgets relative to editorial world and three really values photography like their photo department has a lot of power and that's always what you want as a photographer because a lot of publications their editorial department has more power than the photo department so you end up kind of chasing around and trying to get where you know the, the photo department at the new york times is has a big bass and so they, if they want to run double page spread, they run a double page spread. If they want to send you for an extra day, they send you for an extra day. Like they don't have to answer to anyone, which is really great as a photographer. Mm -hmm. um, they, they produce a lot of work too. So they are hiring lots of photographers lots of the time, which is great because it means, you know, um, there's, there's work. Um, they're very competitive. For sure you know like they're always kind of looking for who the next great shooter is and stuff so you might get a lot of work from them and then not work for them for a while and then kind of get work and um you know it's um it, it'd be similar in in some ways it's kind of similar to sports to a degree where you get to certain levels and like you know it's not that there's no loyalty but there's like you kind of are in an arena where it's all performance based. So it's, you're only as good as your last shoot, you know, you're only as um, kind of, so you're always kind of when you're shooting for the times and, and, and whatnot, you know, you're trying to do your best, you know, you're really trying to, and you know, not just because you want another job, but more so because you're like, a lot of people are going to read this. A lot of people are going to see it. I have to do this properly. There's a responsibility to make sure that you're being, you know, authentic and doing all the right things. And um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy working for them. Um, there's a lot of great editors. They have a lot of sections, there's sports, there's science, there's arts and culture. You know, there's so many different things that you end up doing a lot of really interesting stuff from time to time with them. And um, yeah, they're, they're um, it's, it's nice to do work that you know people are going to see too because that's kind of the point right yeah. so um it, it is you know i always enjoy um when i get an assignment come through from them it's, is that your biggest profile gig ever is the cover of new york times magazine or have you had like other stuff out there you're that's pretty well known i would say that was probably definitely um 
as much as far as like people seeing it for sure you know that's a heavily have i mean i think it's got to be one of the most read publications and um because it's the weekend times which is probably right. the most heavily read paper in north america and then their insert so yeah that was a big story for sure that one the cover story that was really cool um is a neat feeling i would i did want to they do this thing called voyages which is they dedicate and i'm not sure if they're doing it still but they dedicate an issue to like a travel thing and they kind of have four or five photographers all shoot different things and that was a big one that one got a lot of attention because um you know um just the way it's presented and stuff it's something a lot of people look forward to um so yeah it, it's it's always nice you know i guess there's certainly an ego element that goes to these things of like if you do a good job and a lot of people see it like you know it's human nature to kind of like wear that to a certain degree mm -hmm. but i think it's also like in any vocation or craft like you want to be doing things well and you want to be doing things in a way that you know you kind of feel like you're pushing yourself and you feel like you're kind of um reaching a level that is you know um not hard to get to but like that it's just not easy you know um and that those you know a lot of those stories the behind the scenes of doing them and putting them together like you know there's things that go on and happen that are not easy and the time you know when you're working for the times it's not like you have a team of not even the, the times you know it's not like you have a team of people who are like oh we've got your flights book we've got your this book we've arranged this we've arranged that it's like you're you know you're kind of piecing everything together yourself so when it comes together it's a nice feeling yeah well thanks for sharing that that's really neat stuff um Real quick, I want to touch on Australian basketball. You've done some stuff for the Times for Australian basketball. What's the big thing they do different than other parts of the world? Well, I'll, I, I think one of the things that really opened my eyes was, again, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did a story on the NBA Academy mm -hmm. down here. Um, so the NBA Academy, there's a few of them. There's one in Africa. I think there's one in Europe, maybe, um, or in Asia. Um, and it brings together players from different parts of the world and kind of, you know, insulates them and they train there. And, um, and it works here, it works alongside the Australian Institute of Sport um, and the Center of Excellence for Basketball. So it's like these kind of funnel systems where they highlight talented players and bring them in and, um, kind of you know nurture them because they don't have obviously a massive talent pool here so they try and bring the good players together because mm -hmm. where they're playing they probably won't have the level of competition and stuff to really improve so they bring them together and what i noticed and you know i spoke a lot to um the coaches there who you know have a lot of experience and are pretty well respected coaches and i think the nature of basketball here is again it's not the number one sport it's not you know kind of um the big draw so the kids are really grounded um they are they have a chip on their shoulder a lot of the time because they're you know kind of the underdog from day one um being an australian kind of um the style of play is also really interesting where it's very much a team sport. Um, this is what a lot of the coaches explained to me and kind of what I observed too, like is that the kids fundamentally seem to learn the game in a really maybe a bit of a different way to other places where, you know, being a, a good team player. And you see that in, with the exception of probably Ben Simmons, a lot of the Australians who play in the league our glue guys are guys like Patty Mills, Matthew Delvadova, guys who like kind of really buy into, you know, they're the kind of guy you want on a team, you know? Um, and I think that is a part of basketball Australia coming up is that they really, you know, you see them even with their national team, they, they overachieve a lot mm -hmm. um, because they play together, you know? Um, 
And I think that's a big part of Australian basketball from what I've seen. Yeah, good observation on that. Hey, man, we're going to finish up with the lightning round here. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Favorite basketball player of all time? Besides Favorite. Chuck Robinson. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Um, favorite basketball player of all time, man, I mean, I, MJ, you know, as a kid for sure. Um, but I'm going to have to go with like, I might throw in like big country Reeves just for a curveball there. Look that one up. Young bucks, big country, uh, <laughs> Brian Reeves from Oklahoma state, but third or second pick of the Grizzlies. I think he was the number one pick that year. I don't think that's uh, i don't think vancouver would have had a number one pick right well we, yeah because we were an expansion team like um well you know we'll have to search that but i he was our he was vancouver's first draft pick i believe like and ever no better than a pasty white guy with a beard i mean that's perfect for canada right yeah you know i mean low country right, right. no he's not my favorite player but i definitely have a softball for him but um, you know, I used to like guys like Dan Marley and dudes like that too. Like, you know, I, I just really could relate to those dudes, you know, like I loved guys who just hustled and as corny as that sounds, I actually really did, you know, um, Thunder Dan, you know, I met Jack when I was young. I remember, remember that. Um, you met who? Jack Sigma. I remember that name. Sonics. Yeah, I met met him when I was young. That left an impression. Okay. Um, Brian Reeves, our crack investigative team, will look and see if he was uh, <laughs> drafted first or third. We'll get on that. Go see on fact checking. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the best player you ever played against? Uh, probably Steve. Yeah. Steve Nash. Um, I mean, maybe at the time he wasn't the best because he was obviously, but, you know, obviously in the, in the, in the long run, um, probably Steve. Yeah. Okay. Biggest win of your basketball career. Biggest win of my basketball career. That's a great question, man. Um, I remember. Okay. Who were we playing? I remember a, a win at home. I think we were playing actually is probably like Pemberton or something, you know? Um, but I remember in the gym, uh, we had a full, full gymnasium um, for one of the only times in my whole high school career. And our team played great. I think it was Pemberton. And um, I remember, you know, feeling really accomplished after that because it was in front of our school again we were in a basketball school nobody really cared about basketball or anything and um somehow we had a packed gym and we won in front of them and i remember like having a sense of like accomplishment after walking through the halls after that we didn't have a lot of wins though i'm not gonna lie to you okay here's a new one in the lightning round most famous person in your phone contacts <sighs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you shit um famous person in my phone contacts oh, dude i don't think i have anybody i did meet jfk jr though one time at a wedding oh so, wow not that's pretty in my neat. Phone contacts, clearly but yeah that was pretty big um at the same wedding that i met jack sigma who was getting married it's my buddy's sister <laughs> she they lived down the street but she was Miss Teen Canada when she was younger. And so she dated JFK Jr. And um, yeah, anyways, there. Um, that, Wait, she, she invited her ex boyfriend to her wedding. That's pretty baller. It was, I think it was a status thing. Totally. And like one of the most good looking guys ever to face her, you know, walk this earth. That's, if that'd be, I don't know if I'd be okay with that. No, imagine being the group. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this guy? I'm never gonna get a great wedding gift from him, but does he need to be here? He's handsome. <laughs> totally. Uh, and why is Jack Sigma here? <laughs> I don't know why he was there, to be honest. Um, what's your hobbies when you're not taking pictures or hanging out with your family? Um, I love to ski. 
love to surf. Um, uh, you know, those are probably the two things. I, I mean, I try to get to the gym as much as I can to look after the, the temple, which is, you know, the wheels are falling off, man. We, you know, after all those years of, of pounding it. Um, but yeah, just trying to stay, you know, stay active. I, I love getting in the ocean when I can. And I love, I love to ski when I can. So being outdoors. Yeah. Like and that. lastly, it, yeah, perfect. Um, what's your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie. Um, actually, you know, to be honest, my favorite <laughs> film of all time is the original Muppet movie. Great. Yeah. Love it. To this day, love it. Watched it probably eight months ago on YouTube. <laughs> Only place I can find it. Um, yeah, definitely. I got. I, I'm just. I. I'm a big Muppets guy. Who's your favorite Muppet? Kermit, probably. I respect Kermit. And I mean, Animal. I love Animal too. But you know, you can only take so much of Animal, right? Like he's a one-trick pony, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know who Josie and I's favorite Muppet is? It's random, but Rolf. Yep. Rolf is the most sensible Muppet there is. Like, if something needs to get done under pressure, Rolf's not going to crash. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Get him to drive. We, we, we were going to name our dog Rolf, and I was like, it's a girl, and I was like, ah. well, we love Rolf. I don't think the name works. But Disrespectful. Yeah, it's, you know, you got to be respectful of Jim Henson. Do you know, are they called Muppeteers or Puppeteers? Do you know that? Officially puppeteers. But are they Muppeteers? Probably, they probably have their own genre. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know if anyone learned anything today, but we had a good time chatting, and uh, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> Give the people what they want, man. I love Chuck, it. Thanks. Chuck Robinson stories, if Chuck Robinson <laughs> even is the name of David's brother. I love it. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, thanks for being on. Hey, everybody, this is the Prep Athletics Podcast. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today with uh, my good friend and um, great photographer, great basketball player, great uh, human being from down under, Dave Murray Smith. And uh, if you like what you hear, we have more basketball-centric uh, podcasts available on YouTube and all the major podca podcasting platforms. But uh, you know what? We're going to get different people on here, you know? And if you don't want to Tune into these, not a problem. Every one of them is not going to be prep school ball, but Dave and I would never have fostered this relationship had it not been for basketball. All right. So the reason I wanted to have him on is just to say basketball can take you on different paths in life and you can meet some very interesting people along the way and people that you will eventually call your brothers. And Dave is one of those guys. So that's why I want to have people like him on. So Dave, brother, good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I just appreciate you being in my life. You too, man. Thanks for having me.